I'm joined by Matt Cahoon, also known as Xenogoth. He's a writer, blogger, and DJ. He has written for Vast Abrupt, the Sum Journal of Art Criticism and Theory, and the Crisis Journal for Contemporary Philosophy. He also currently writes at his own blog, xenogothic.wordpress.net. The link will be in the description of the podcast. We're going to be discussing the work of Mark Fisher, also known as K-Punk, who was a writer, critic, cultural theorist, and teacher based at Goldsmiths University UK. Initially achieving acclaim for his blog K-Punk in the early 2000s, which Simon Reynolds described as a one-man magazine superior to most magazines in Britain, something I can completely agree with. Fisher was also widely known and is still widely known for his text Capitalist Real- Realism, which we'll be discussing today, which was published in 2009, alongside his other publications, Ghosts of My Life, published in 2014, and The Weird and the Eerie, published in 2017, both of which we will also be discussing today. So now into the discussion with Matt Cahoon. Okay, so I message you the question. If you could have five thinkers in a room and listen to the conversation, which five would it be? Have you, have you thought on this? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I mean, the main thing I was thinking of is <laughs> what kind of dinner do I want to have? <laughs> Am I thinking of, like, people are going to fall out or um, have sort of good conversation? Yeah, it's a, I think that's why I have the question, because is you could really you could really annoy some, some philosophers you don't like. <laughs> Uh, gosh, um, I think it would be like living or dead. It would have to be um, Bataille, which he, but I think just because he'd got on everyone's nerves. And then I'd probably be interested to see what he'd be like with Nick Land, uh, especially now. Yeah, I was, was going to say, was it is it a young Nick Land or an old Nick Land? <laughs> I'm now looking at my... Uh... Okay. <laughs> Old Nick Lands, just to sort of see uh, belligerent. I'm now trying to um, look over my bookshelf to see for. Uh, um, actually, no, that's true. So I guess I'd try and I'd try and like get a lineage together. So maybe it would be Bataille, Land, Nietzsche, and like Deleuze or something, and just see how they'd actually get on if they just end up uh, some sort of successive belligerent I yeah, know, I'm not sure I want to go near near the room to be honest I think I'd like I'd leave the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, yeah I have to remember that I'd have to be in there too I'd, that's the kind of thing I think I'd like to watch from afar but uh, <laughs> five minutes five minutes of just kind of terror yeah then, set them up have like a nice spread and then sit behind like a <laughs> two-way glass or something yeah yeah definitely. <laughs> one, one of them two-way mirrors that you... yeah exactly <laughs> okay right so uh, i was thinking about you know just discussing specific philosophers and if you think about quite a lot of philosophers there's clear places to start um and i think we, i think with mark the clearest the clearest place oh, that's probably what i should ask actually is, is what's your kind of history and where did you where did you first uh, get into or hear about Mark's Mark's work. Um, I've actually tried to pin this down and not very successfully because it's kind of one of those things that I think just filtered in. Um, I think I came to I, I I was a big Hyperdub fan, which is Steve Goodman's label, um, and I think I was listening to stuff that was on Hyperdub, and I bought Steve's book Sonic Warfare, and through that learn about uh, on the back of sonic warfare there's a um like an endorsement from kojo eshin so then i bought kojo's book and i think via kojo i then came to mark and uh it was around when ghost of my life came out and i bought that book and then kind of realized i think i'd read k-punk before but hadn't really absorbed what it was and kind of just knew about i don't know i think i just kind of knew about that circle sort of by being in other circles yeah i think that's that's usually the way with the philosophers you become or the thinkers you become obsessed with is when you think back you just have no real clue how you even 
I mean, especially especially with kind of CCR, CCRU and, and Fisher and Land, that's a certain sphere where you just think, how the hell did I end up here? Yeah. I think that's I think that's part of the plan. I feel like not being able I think that's why I've tried to follow the breadcrumbs back quite so much because it feels like some sort of CCRU psyop that was sort of intended all along. A hundred percent. I'm gonna have to do it, find a CC, someone to do the CCRU episode, but I think that might be kind of you know coveting insanity. Yeah. <laughs> because I I've done the same thing of trying to you you're following you're reading some book and then you follow the smallest footnote and next thing you know it's kind of 3 a.m and <laughs> you're on web.archive.org on the, yeah. just the most obscure 1990s site and you just think um, have they constructed this it, you know is was this intended or, or are they just not very organized yeah um it's beautiful <laughs> yeah no it really is i think it, i think it's a fantastic way to do philosophy uh and thinking original thinking but yeah i think um we definitely in a way, have to start with capitalist realism because I, I think most people would consider that Marx magnum opus. You know, that's that's the thing yeah. where it becomes quite serious because people, a lot of people know for K-punk before, long before actually, yeah. capitalist realism, um, and yet that's that's the thing that at the same time puts him kind of almost officially in the in the runnings, you know, of a, of a, like a serious philosopher. But at the same time, because of its radical nature, keeps him just outside of it, which is which is a really, really interesting thing. So I think if we start with the title, you know, what what does capitalist realism mean? Uh, well, I guess the it's the, the I think Mark offers a definition right in the start of the book, which is I think he he gets the. He gets the, if not the the the, the, the term itself, because I mean he was always making up sort of neologisms and things, um, but the general idea is from Jameson and or Zizek, which is that uh, the end of the world is easier to imagine than the end of capitalism, yeah. and I think I guess Mark takes that idea, bottles it down into this really pithy, really memorable quite marketable phrase if anything which i think is really important actually um and then just runs with it um yeah so yeah so imagining imagining the end of the world is actually quite it's almost a very simple feat you could imagine the globe exploding or wildfire you know if you were thinking of it in a literal sense but if you actually try imagine or visualize or uh, encapsulate the end of capitalism what is it you're you know you're trying to do there i think that's Somewhat, what what he's trying to say is that capitalism is—I um, don't know if you'd agree with this—but it's it's morphed into something so absolutely strange. Uh, you know, he he goes on later from the Deleuze and Guattari quote. That, you know, it's the unnameable thing, um, and yeah, um, I don't know if you have any more to say on 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 that initial initial nature of capitalism that he's he that Marx specifically is dealing with how he envisions capitalism as opposed to other people well i think that i think that 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 sense that you just described is what he is what's captured for him in that the first scene that he talks about in the book from um children of men um where it's this scene in the film um where this the, i think i can't remember the character i'm going to have to flick through it <laughs> uh, uh what's the character's name clive no, that is that the yeah, Clive, yeah, so Clive Owen's character Theo. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, he goes to visit um, a friend in Battersea Power Station, and in Battersea Power Station, he's got Michelangelo's David, Picasso's Guernica, Pink Floyd's Inflatable Pig, all this stuff. Um, which, at, which at one point was all of these items were extremely emotionally charged at one point or another. Yeah, so they're like they're cultural treasures, is what he calls it. And I think that the fact that the world is more or less, the world is, if not literally, it's kind of thinkably ended, like because people can't have children anymore. So there's kind of this, this, there's this new violence to that sense of the end of history. And yet still, despite that end being very palpable for like society, there's still this coveted, um, unnameable sort of power and force these objects have. And I think that's kind of what you described, right? It's that it's that that unnameable thing that comes with these objects that are basically they just signify 
especially in this universe that the film's set in, they signify massive amounts of wealth and power. But it's still, it's despite that being impotent in that point in history, it, there's still something there. And it's that sort of eerie something that I think is what Mark thinks of capital and being. Yeah. Because yeah, on the on the in this section of the book, he this is when he really he brings time into into relation with capital. And just across the page from actually there, he says, you know, what what happens if the young are no longer capable of producing surprises? And I think actually now I've I've just realised this right now actually that if you take the children and men, you know, complete one hundred percent pure infertility as a metaphor, it wouldn't actually matter if they had children or not because. Because the youth, the youth can't do anything anyway. So even if there was youth, it wouldn't be doing anything because capital has just completely, completely taken it. Yeah, and I think it's there's there's actually a moment in the film that I always really reminds me of of kind of the irony of what Mark's pointing out there and what the film's pointing out. Is I think there's I'm kind of also aware that your listeners might not be familiar with it, but so I'm not sure how to contextualize it. But there's a moment later on where Theo is going to meet um, a character's name I can't remember again. He's played by Michael Caine anyway. Um, and they're kind of, they're reminiscing, they're not reminiscing, they're kind of, they're pondering on the future and what their sort of fate is and whatever. And then Michael Caine's character kind of breaks the tension by playing some like what's supposedly future music. And it's an Aphex Twin track that's just got like screams laden over it. Yeah, it's that from from memory, it's one of the most kind of hellish absolutely chaotic um apex twin tracks yeah but but then but then there's the strange irony that you've got this film from 2006 that's then using using a track from what is it like 2001 to which has barely changed they add some screams onto it as if to make it somehow more hellish but a a a, 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 a what five year old track is used to signify a track a future music, which I think there's like this weird sort of complexity in that moment in the film that kind of exemplifies this point that Mark's trying to bring out that, yeah, it's about this sort of impotence, but then that's already sort of embedded in the film in all of its sort of moments that you can't really escape that. Like it's it, the, the mindset that it's critiquing is, is there even when it doesn't mean it to be. So it's one of the horrible absolutely horrifying things in, in if one takes capital in in this way which i think a lot of, a lot of contemporary thinkers now are doing it is that you know you can't you can't just kind of halt this you can't stop it this process is ongoing and it, you know just one paragraph down the page here he says the exhaustion of the future does not even leave us with the past so capital not only is it continuing this this impotence this this death of youth and death of new new surprises but the, all it has to use as well is is the past so the what the small amount of the past that we used to use imaginatively and creatively is now just getting absolutely kind of it's just spread it into the future so thinly that it's completely hollow and that hollowness is kind of what i think is super key for mark in um yeah i think that i think that hollowness is what's key throughout not just this but sort of all of his works that there's always that I don't know again i think that's what fascinates me so much about mark's work is that there's always this thing in the background that's not always necessarily capital but there's just some unnameable thing and naming that unnameable is kind of the inherent challenge that so much the thought that surrounds him tries to deal with so if you if you could somehow could find a definition for this thing then perhaps that would be the like the first stepping stone to actually because i think i think marx i mean it's it's quite clear that in marx's descriptions of capitalist realism that it's 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 kind of obvious that someone would want to overcome this but at the same time uh, much like many thinkers, they they pose a problem, but never really can find too many ways to actually. There's not many tactics here to kind of overcome it. He's he said there's a, there's a part at the end where he says that to come overcome capitalism, it's so capitalism is so and capital is so entwined with almost our ontology now, our being that you have to complete create this complete other thing to overcome it. I think that uh, as much as that's like a Mark diagnoses that, and he diagnoses it really well in capitalist realism. I think, at least at that sort of point in time, um, it's not 
it's it's he kind of yeah he he diagnoses a problem at a moment in time, but it's not an it's not a new problem, and it's a problem that you have like in Foucault's later writings, and that's huge for Deleuze and Guattari. Um, that's sort of all the structuralist stuff that it's always there, and it's kind of like an update that sort of diagnoses these newfangled shiny bits that's kind of been developed to distract from that nevertheless ever present problem it's even you know it's that it's the specter it's the specter that haunts that's kind of there all the way in Marx. it's like it's the same problem but i wouldn't necessarily so oh um i was gonna say i wouldn't necessarily say that there's no i mean maybe there's no tactics here which is a very short book and it's definitely a diagnosis but i think that's what's kind of strange and what's so difficult about mark's work on the whole is that he had plenty of tactics and strategies and suggestions, but they never ended up in books. They were always, they were always in his essays that have sort of languished elsewhere, and will probably come out later in this new. I know there's this new posthumous publication, um, collection coming out, but yeah, all Mark's tactics never sort of rose to the fore. But I think like he had plenty of them. Oh, okay. Um, that's one thing I was going to say there, perhaps, because I did email you about this kind of linear way that we could go through it. But it's so, it's so all his work is so completely entwined that you you've already brought up hauntology, which is uh, one of the absolutely key key theories that Marx Mark works with, and it um, this idea that that capital. Uh, I've just turned to this this page here, page four, and it says. The power of capitalist realism derives in, in part from the way that capitalism subsumes and consumes all of previous history. And and it definitely consumes the past and uses that to its to its massive advantage. But it, it also um, to completely depletes the future and the idea of future. So I think if I'm reading Mark correctly here, the, the hauntology wasn't the typical haunt of a ghost from the past, uh, as in some cliche. It's the haunting of an idea that we used to have of the future. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's a twisting there. I always think of it less as like a, like, I mean, I guess cause people, people talk of hauntology, especially like being sort of that's like hauntology from Derrida. Derrida's using it as a play on the specter from Marx and Engels communist manifesto or whatever. Um, but, but I think I almost feel like the, the haunt bit is just kind of, it's almost baggage from that old language of a spectre. Like I feel like what Mark's talking about kind of necessarily needs the update of being like a, a hologram instead. Like it's not, it's not some, it's not the remnants of something that's dead and past. It's sort of a, it's, it's just something that's not quite materialized. Like, like, um, like I think I wrote a post about this on my blog that was about uh, the, 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 the new Blade Runner film um, with a, uh, uh what's his name ryan gosling yeah ryan gosling's character k um who lives with this hologram girlfriend and it's almost like she's not she's not a she's not a ghost or something that's lost she's like a she's just the immaterialized she's an immaterialized future of domesticity that he desires and i feel like that's kind of the 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 the, the, the baggage of the language of specters is kind of like I mean, it's 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 an unfortunate it's unfortunately open to misreadings in that way of, of it being so focused on the past. But I think you're absolutely right that the future is what's key there, that it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an immaterial promise or something. Okay. Yeah. So thinking about that, actually, that's, um, it's interesting that you've put it that way because that, it seems, especially with this book and a lot of Mark's political writings, um, especially as well with, he makes this actually quite clear in uh, exit from the vampire castle. It's quite a famous article that, He's always there's a definite underlying sense of an essence of Marxism and communism in Marx's work, but when, like you said about him trying to escape from that old language, he's also trying to escape from the didactic, finger wagging, uh, old old Marxism, which is you know extremely kind of maybe not militaristic in its actuality. That's that's arguable, but the writing. Uh, and the I'm just trying to think of the word. It comes across as very, very uh, authoritative at times, and it's moving. He's trying to move away from that. I think. Yeah, um, I'm. I think that I'm having a quick revisit because actually this is a. I think it is one of. It's a. It's a brilliant text, but yeah, one that's super controversial. And I think still is very controversial. Um, 
and especially, especially so like Mark's using it to, to sort of defend Russell Brand in a way and talk about the class consciousness that he sees as being, it's almost like a, I think it's like a lip service. It's like that there's a, I guess, I guess the way that I see that article is that, and, I, and again, this is something that it, it runs through everything that he's done, especially in capitalist realism, that like if you were to frame the question of um, the, the, the question of capitalist realism, which is why is the world easier to, why is the end of the world easy to imagine than the end of capitalism? And I guess that what he would diagnose that as is it's a kind of melancholy. And so the fact that mental health is so important to a lot of his writings, that there's this kind of deflatedness, there's a, it's a deflation of consciousness, whether that's class consciousness or otherwise, that is kind of endemic. And I almost feel like why exiting the vampire's castle was so controversial was that yeah, he was kind of rejecting that finger wagging, but at the same time, maybe diagnosing where that was coming from in a way that a lot of people didn't like or necessarily agree with. That you know that the 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 the, the bad what do you call it? There's a, there's a the stench of bad conscience and witch hunting moralism, as if that's kind of a a reaction to melancholy. To sort of it's like a grief response that people get upset and lash out or something. And I guess that there's a way that that's not really an easy thing to say. <laughs> So I'm, I'm just trying to. Where do you think this this old what Marx says is finger wagging kind of leftism is still coming from? That's quite a tough question. Um, I mean, yeah, but I think that's. I think it's precisely that. It's it's this melancholy. It's like it's so so the the when the the, the class was that Mark was teaching at Goldsmiths where I was a student before he died. That was where the the very first um, lecture that he gave where he was talking about post-capitalist desire, which is the name of the course, and talking, asking questions of like, do we, do we, is there such a thing as post-capitalist desire? People kind of talk about a future beyond capitalism, but is that something that we actually do desire? How can we, how can we quantify that? How can we sort of understand that desire and how we might realize it? And the way that he said he was thinking about that was because of left melancholy, which is like uh, something that was diagnosed all the way back by Walter Benjamin. Um, as like the the left has uh, just a, has a natural propensity to being down on itself, um, and I think that that's that's morphed in so many different ways and directions, and has been analysed by plenty of people. Mark would reference. Um, Wendy Brown, um, as a writer that wrote and has also written a lot about left melancholy, um, and I feel like he, for him this finger wagging was precisely if this like is 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 a reaction to that. It's like to say that uh, I don't know. It's like a bad mood, right? It's like uh, it's 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 kind of a, a bad mood that's to be expected given the situation that we're in, and that the left always diagnoses, but the left never seems to diagnose that it's it's it always seems to see itself as above these descriptions as if to say that this is something that's affecting society but we are the left we are enlightened and we sort of are more aware of what's going on so this doesn't affect us but i feel like what he's pointing out is that this finger wagging and this moralism is precisely an effect of this kind of late capital malaise that the left is sort of it's frustrated with itself not being able to its own sort of lack of workable solutions or whatever yeah so the the left in some ways there. What what Mark calls by the uh, calls the late capitalist malaise, the kind of teenage, I think, depressive hedonism or hedonism. The left's kind of, uh, would you say, the left has kind of s subsumed itself into that, but from that, the left is still trying to act as above. Whereas, in in actually quite quite a Deleuze and Guattari fashion, it's the left should see itself as kind of imminent, too late late stage capitalism to capitalist realism and actually move from that as opposed to trying to move from this kind of false position of already above above this thing but really it's it's if it acts from there all capital is doing is just subsuming it back into itself yeah yeah so like the i mean you could argue that the left has kind of already started to do that where it talks about like um i mean mark being one of the people that was so good at diagnosing this where um the arguments that the the left doesn't really want a, f a future beyond capitalism because it's always you know it's it can't let like, put down its iPhones or its Starbucks or whatever and 
can't stop using Uber or things like this. And that's kind of always a criticism that's fired that way. And so then you have these kind of um, like for fully automated luxury communism or whatever, for example. So luxury communism understood as a as a communism that retains all of the wealth of capital, but also finds a wealth beyond it. So to say you don't yeah. have to you don't have to reject these material goods to be a communist. You don't have to you don't have to reject these desires that we've kind of been fed. You can move on to something else. And that's something that I think, you know, that's kind of besides the point, but it's to say that that's sort of the positive that's kind of been, is being analysed and is being sort of dealt with and discussed. But no one, but then that's kind of left, what the negative side of that is left behind and to say that, you know, if if, if we can recognise that we desire these things and they actually improve our lives or whatever, but we don't, that doesn't consider the flip side that actually results in this kind of moralism, this sort of, the, the, which is likewise products of the same system. But those aren't critiqued and analysed in the same way that the positives are. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think there is actually still some leftists who abide by that kind of silly, silly argument of, and I think that there was actually a recent episode of, uh, have I got news, to, news for you that covered this? The, the, the very typical, oh, look at the Occupy protesters, who are anti-capitalist, but they're, they're all holding Starbucks, as if in something that isn't capitalist, in a world without capitalism, there isn't going to be a coffee chain. You know, it's just, it's a ridiculous idea. It's you, you, You're still going to have coffee and you're still going to have mobile yeah. telecommunications devices in a world without capitalism. It's just how those things are going to affect you differently. Because I, I think what what's happening here, and what Mark Dark knows is, is that yeah, we, we, we have these things, but the way in which capitalism uses them intrinsically just kind of strips our lives of, of a lot. Mobile phones are currently kind of destroying attention spans and they're, they're filled with just kind of, well, rubbish and junk. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure I agree that that would be how, how or how that would be different. I mean, I, I guess that's, that's, that's an argument that would be taken into what is, what is desire after capitalism? So within these lectures, was there any finishing finishing place or, or route that was being taken towards what desire might be after capitalism? Um, unfortunately, not. I mean, there was it was a fifteen week course, and only five of the, the classes went ahead before Mark died. Um, uh, but it was more of just like the background. So I think um, the last class that he did before he died was on. Uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard's Libidinal Economy. Uh, what else did he do? I've got the reader around here somewhere. Oh, and there was and it was a bunch of obscure text too, actually, about sort of um, post-68 politics in Europe. Um, the, the, the affinities, the, the, the now lost affinity at that moment that was between sort of workers and students that now sort of is like a pipe dream. It was basically sort of antecedents that... that we're going to form com- um, uh, acid communism. So I think it was his way of sort of testing out a bunch of ideas and, yeah, showing the seeds for what would then become his... The, the, yeah, the finishing, the, finishing, the, the finishing comment on that course would be his book, which now, unfortunately, we will never get. But um, I think there was, a lot, there was a lot of thought that had been developed on that side. Okay. Do you have do you have a potential as much as you can overview of what the vision of Mark Fisher's acid communism was going to be? Um, well, well, no. I mean, I, no. I don't think I, I. I have my own interpretation. Um, okay. Yeah. I think I think that's as much as as one could ask for. Yeah. I mean, I think that, and that's kind of something to stress for sure, because I feel like. Um, you don't want to do a disservice to uh, kind of unfinished. Well, yeah, no, I do a disservice. I don't want to put words in his mouth, yeah. but I kind of feel like that the. It, um, I mean, so as I understand it, acid communism as a phrase for Mark kind of grew out of. Um, uh, there's a lecture that he gave at a, like a design conference of all things, um, and he was talking about uh, designer communism which is kind of like a, a play on the sort of 80s insult of designer socialism, kind of like champagne socialism. Um, okay. 
and so he, he was to sort of playing with that um and it was initially sort of a phrase that came out as a joke is to sort of say well how do you how do you marry um a sort of 21st century understanding of communism with these other potentials that he felt had been um sort of left unfulfilled from the 60s and 70s uh, seeing that time as a kind of um, revolutionary period beyond the stereotypes, in a way, um, for all the reasons. So, yeah, so you have, like, the not just the the psychedelia of the 60s and the summer of love as, like, a kind of the sexual revolution or whatever, but also these massive political shifts, both in the US and Europe and elsewhere. Um, and so I guess what Mark wanted to do with Athlete Communism was to try and like capitalist realism it's kind of like a uh, it's a it's a provocation that he throws out there to try and um see what a revisiting of the mechanisms and things that were in play at that time could mean for us today um in a time when they've generally been dismissed and i think but i think there's a the issue with that which which is where my personal interpretation comes in is that since Marx's death, there has been there's been acid communism has kind of become quite it's kind of become a bit of a meme, which I'm sure you would have enjoyed. But elsewhere has become things like acid Corbynism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was in the Guardian. It was in oh, oh, yeah, uh, that was, that was a bunch of other big sort of left, the, quite you know, was, um, right. mainstream, popular left wing publications. Um. And there are other sort of variants of 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 the the play on that. I think there's also like I think I saw on Twitter there's like a a London yeah. radical mindfulness workshop thing that is now sort of running with those ideas. Um, so yeah, it was yeah. I think it's. I mean, I think they're yeah they're adopting that phrase, but I think it just doesn't sit right with me at all because I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't relate to the work. That, it doesn't relate to Marx's work in a way that I think it should. <laughs> like I think that. In talking about acid communism and the potentials of the sixties and seventies, just like with Marx's own work, I think that to to go back to that point and to then just sort of base that on a kind of new sense of being a hippie or whatever is that's a massive disservice to I think what he was doing. I think the ideas are rooted there, but to then dismiss everything that came afterwards and to just kind of idealize those things that were happening then and not really just to just just drag that into now without the kind of technological updates that so interested Mark is just a massive disservice. Um, and I think acid communism is going to be way more than than that. I think that I think I think you'd be correct. At least at least that's how I'd read it. And saying that would be a disservice because if that would just taking the the ideas of the sixties and kind of dragging them forward and and just having having them again would be to kind of ignore the overarching message of capitalist realism that actually that movement was itself. I mean, 60s onwards, you, I, I would argue you've got complete subsumption into capital. I mean, there, 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 there was new ideas. There was a lot of throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, and I think when Mark or Ian K-Punk actually says about the end of the 80s was P. Gabriel's sledgehammer, I think that's where you could almost put this kind of stop to that the era before that then you've got the small era of of the 90s with the ccru and what they were doing and the cyberpunk thing and beyond that it just got it just kind of not much happens um so yeah the idea that to just to drag the ideas from the 60s forward again would almost be like just to do exactly the same thing again which is the typical right-wing argument against against communism is is you know oh it wasn't real communism which which that actually would be if they were to just simply do it again. Whereas the there was an interview you linked recently actually with Aaron Bastiani where he he articulates it very well about what what's kind of meant by well he specifically is talking about fully automated luxury communism, um, but it bringing communism into a world where UBI is possible, automation is possible, you know these things weren't possible back in uh, yeah the forties. Well, I think it's um, I mean I think what's key for that is it's like um. Like the way that Bastani frames it in terms of, um, yeah, so I think he says something like these, these new technologies allow for, the uh, uh, yeah, so like you say, automation, but also I think the, the, I mean, the 60s ideas that Mark is bringing forward is like, um, I think in 
he references the Beatles um, uh, sort of anti-work ethic of like stay in bed, float upstream. Uh, the sort of the Lennon and Oko's like bed protest is kind of it's kind of like an anti-praxis, like just um, impotence, and to just say that you know we don't have to do anything. And that's kind of as if as if to make that a kind of desire is that you don't it's it's like that um I mean like you think about that now and what relevance that has and I think I remember reading reports talking about we knew we now have this thing called presenteeism or something like rather than having absenteeism at work where people call in sick all the time you've got this thing that people now don't call in sick even if they really should um, and that's sort of being like a rolling problem and it's like well. Well, truly, to, to to combat that sort of new development in the sort of the capitalist system of work, to to re to bring back those new anti-work ideas and to kind of radicalize them, uh, as if not not to radicalize them, but to use them to radicalize um, new conceptions of work. That's kind of a worthwhile endeavor. I mean, maybe maybe this isn't what Fisher meant, but the the idea of anti-work is in its purest sense is it's quite silly because you need work in some form but definitely a reconceptualization of what work means because like you said about the presenteeism i think i've read a few articles on this and actually these these people who are who are should be off you know to take care of their health which should come before pretty much everything they they're not actually working when they go in anyway uh because they're too ill to work so it's not it's not a case of production or uh, productivity. It's a case of almost keeping up appearances for capital. Um, so, so what the reconception of work look like in a, a Fisher esque reconception um, of work? I think I actually this is something that I kind of wish I'd have the opportunity to ask Mark. Is that um, there's the the blogger uh, Dam Yehu. Um, who's, I think his book's yeah. called The Real Movement. And his tagline on his blog is, um, communism is free time and nothing else, which I think is the most brilliant provocation. And that's kind of what I imagine this kind of post-work society to be. It's like, well, if you're not working, what do you do in your free time? I mean, you can make, I've come home from work today and we're making a podcast, like, and that's cool. And that's like, that's that's something that's kind of we're, we're, you know producing something, producing thought, thinking about things, um, because we've got the time to. Um, and I think that I, I know personally that if I had, I didn't have to work so much, I'd produce even more. I'd do things that I was passionate about, um, and that I think would nevertheless you know improve the world in some way. I'd like to think so. Um, I don't know how that works in terms of like you know. But like, like, uh, I guess it's like inventors, like the kind of the ideal of an inventor being someone that's just kind of like um, compulsively creating things to better society. Um, it's kind of the mad scientist stereotype. Like that's communism. <laughs> that's 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 what do you do if you've got free time? And now, and now I kind of want to eat my words because I've got an image of like Rick and Morty communism. Yeah, um, that, that doesn't sound great. But I think that that's. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, like, I think I'd, I'd rather um, work retail than live in a, a Rick and Morty <laughs> comic as well. Um, yeah, but I, I do not. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to kind of, kind of push you a bit. Uh, do you not, do you not think that somewhat the world of post work? Do you, do you think it's a pipe dream, or do you think genuinely that capital is 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 genuinely kind of holding back the possibility of that for its own gain? Um, I don't think capital is holding the possibility back. I feel like that's kind of the the horror of late capital. And, then, and I think it's the fact that it's framed as a horror of like the horror of automation, the kind of Luddite, the, the, the kind of Luddite sensibility that capitalism is almost sort of dragged with itself to kind of, to kind of, perpetuate itself almost as if to say that this would stop things from yeah. being as they are um it would, it would mean that people were listless and had no sort of thing nothing to do um it's a generally awful thing um but we're seeing it happening and, and it's if it's almost as if that like there's no there's no accounting for what capital wants to do and i guess this is where you get these other controversies of people assigning agency to capital that you can't account for it's as if to talk about it as if it's making sort of decisions and if to say it's sort of it's whether that's 
like as if it's holding itself back or it's holding people back. It's it's so entwined and it's so entangled that to say that I mean yes, yeah. So so it's almost as if the fact that I think what where that comes in for Fisher and the importance of that, it's not necessarily just to say that um capitalism uh, post capitalism no no, no post work society after capitalism to say that whether that's let me have a think of how i actually want to word this are you, are you, i'm going to try to take a guess here are you are you trying to say that that entire idea of work that we have like literally almost the word work is so intrinsically tethered to archaic notions of capital and capitalism and productivity and production that it's, it's you you need a new language to move beyond it um not necessarily i mean the, the word work in particular is kind of a tricky one because it always makes me think of um maurice blanchot who i really like at least in terms of his talking about communism and he talks about um he, he writes this text responding to something that Jean-Luc Nancy said to him, which is that, um, oh, it's such a mess, that Bataille's, Bataille's vision of communism is unworkable on purpose, as if to say that uh, it's, it's a kind of community, sense of community that is inoperable by design because it's beyond work. And uh, Blanchot challenges that by bringing in this sense of that it's not unworkable, but rather it's 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 um, unavowable. So it's not to say that we need a, we need a new language, but it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about that there's this element to capital that is that is you can't really you can't assign language to. But there's also this part to the human condition that you can't assign language to that kind of comes in that in between this. Yeah, there's an interesting quote actually. It's, I think. A really good quote for this on page 15 of Capitalist Realism. Um, Marx says, Capital is an abstract parasite, an insatiable vampire and zombie maker, but the living flesh it converts into dead labor is ours, and the zombie it makes, zombie, the zombies it makes are us. So there's, there's an interest, there's a really strange, n- not so much hypocrisy, but almost kind of horror there that Fisher is, is in one sense taking away something, saying, look, Capital is this parasite. You just you just can't do anything with it. It's there. It's the unnameable thing, and it's there. But it is it is making living flesh. It's making zombies, which are us. But at the same time, in that same sentence, we're only zombies. It's not making us anything great. So there's a strange sense of okay, take up take up not yeah. so much arms, but aut- automize yourselves. But you are still zombies. So I'm I'm not sure how Mark means. What he means by zombies here maybe is the traditional kind of just just dead consumers. Um, but do you think he's saying that we can we can own that? Um, I think. I mean, I think this is this is probably a really key passage, and I think there's it reminds me of a lecture that Mark gave that's on YouTube, um, which is called "How to Kill a Zombie." Um, okay. And I feel like what Mark means by zombies here or if not here, then definitely later when he sort of develops his thought more, is it's like the neoliberal subject. Um, so the subject, the self under neoliberalism, that is kind of the, that is, that's the zombie. And it's not to say that we can own that subjectivity. And I guess this was what comes back to talking about post-work, as if to say that we can't really imagine, I mean, we can when you frame it in the right way, but as if to say we can't imagine life without work. And it's kind of the same, it's kind of different shades of this same problem, which is the end of the world and the end of capitalism and that kind of playoff that I feel like it's, and this is likewise, this it's the thread. I mean, this is where Marx thought's obviously so convoluted as this is a thread that goes all the way to the end, all the way to the com, uh, acid communism. Whereas if it's where we can't imagine the end of the, we, we can imagine the end of the world, not the end of capitalism. We can't imagine the end of work. Uh, we can't imagine the end of the subject. We can't imagine a new sense of self. And I think that that's what, uh, there's a line even in Capitalist Realism that I won't be able to remember the, or maybe I can remember the page, 66. <laughs> I'm, I'm really ashamed that I knew that. Uh, 
Oh yeah. So so yeah. Mark's talking. He says it's my favorite line in the entire book, and he says the required subject, the collective subject, does not exist. Yet the crises, the crisis, like all other global crises we're now facing, demands that it be constructed. And I think that that's like it's um, as if to say that what he means by that that there's you have to kill the zombie, you have to. It's as if to say that, that there's a limit to thought. Like, I mean, you can frame it as like death is a limit of thought or whatever. And here you've got this thing that's like, it's on the verge of kind of being a new subject or it has the potential to be a new subject or to just be beyond thought, but it kind of clings in there as this like undead, but also unliving thing. Yeah, that, that ties in with this this, this earlier quote that I, that I love. It's Mark's really good at, really uh condensing something that you can just kind of spiral out from into god knows what but he says capitalism seamlessly occupies the horizons of the thinkable which is just absolute kind of horror really when you when you think about one philosophically the concept of horizon if you think to think of i mean mostly heidegger here but horizon is in that which you know that which humanity that's that's the limit that's it so the limit of what you can think, which in certain senses, what you can be ontologically, that's what capitalism occupies. So the subjectivity here and, the, and uh, when you're saying, you know, the crisis to move beyond the subject, it, it just sounds absolutely insane because you have to move beyond this, you have to move beyond a horizon. So has that horizon, which Mark's on about here, is that has that been constructed? Um yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that I think I think that's a great passage, um, particularly in the fact that it it, it makes uh, I I I, hadn't, I didn't remember that passage, but it kind of fired off a reference in my brain, which is to Jodie Dean, who's a writer that Mark really admired, and she wrote a book called The Communist Horizon, um, and she gives a definition of horizon in there that I think is brilliant. I've kind of just dragged at the PDF. Um, I'm going to read this whole paragraph, actually, because I think it's great. And I think it, it, it addresses what you just said um, brilliantly. She says, um, well, it's that saying, okay, so there's a lost horizon, right? She's talking about this sort of temporal, the, the horizon of history. And she says, uh, I initially understood the term horizon in a more mundane spatial fashion as the line dividing the visible, separating earth from sky. I like to pretend that I had in mind the cool astrophysics notion of an event horizon, the event horizon surrounds a black hole, a singularity. It's a boundary beyond which events cannot escape. While the event horizon denotes the curvature of space-time affected by a singularity, it's not that much different from the spatial horizon. Both evoke a line demarcating a fundamental division that we experience as impossible to reach, and thus that we can neither escape nor cross, although an external observer could see us cross it. Horizon, then, not tags not a lost future, but a dimension of experience we can never lose. Even if lost in a fog or focused on our feet, we fail to see it. The horizon is real, with a capital R, not just in the sense of impossible, we can never reach it, but also in the sense of the actual format, condition and shape of our setting. And I take both these senses of real to be Lacanian. We can lose our bearings, but the horizon is a necessary condition or shaping of our actuality. It's the, the horizon is the fundamental dev, division establishing where we are. So it's as if to say that, and I think this kind of is kind of a key way of thinking about communism, if not in the way that, I don't know if Mark thought about it this way, but it's a way that I end up thinking about it, is that it's kind of, it's uh, the horizon of communism is always shifting. And it's kind of the, the, I think what's radical about communism in Marx's framing of it is that it reintroduces a sort of temporality. It makes this kind of, it brings back this sort of uh, telos of, of progress, of moving towards something. Even if you can never reach it, it's always, it's always a goal. Okay. So the horizon, the horizon Mark talks about that, that, that perhaps would be, that quote, I mean, I, I perhaps shouldn't say this, perhaps that quote could at least be articulated better by saying oh, yeah, oh, capitalism seamlessly occupies the event horizon of the thing. It, you know, the thought of, of even time. So history just getting subsumed, not in a, in a, in a kind of a textbook history, but what, what one can do with history, what one can learn with history. So 
this horizon I think with capital is it, it, it must be expanding in some way that because capital is capitalism is is moving in some direction. So I'm not sure what you could say this horizon is doing right now. Is it is it merely a, a simulation? That's tricky. The way I mean, this is where, admittedly, I always end up falling down with this kind of thought is that it's. I think what there's the argument that you you, you can't really you don't you can't you can't uh, appreciate directions in which to go if you don't know where you are. Um, but well, that's what I mean. I kind of I think that I tend not to. I try. And, I, I find it difficult to think about capitalism in that sense because I end up being far more focused on the potentials of where to go um and that's kind of probably a backwards way of thinking about it and probably not but i just i think i find it yeah i think it's uh, it's such a it's such a head fuck frankly <laughs> i do yeah i don't i don't no i don't think that's a bad way of thinking about it because in a certain way i do think capital i mean it's not great to anthropomorphize it but it would definitely kind of i think hate the idea of someone finding their bearings from yeah. it because then, then this this kind of vampiric parasite then isn't the one with the primary power. So it's this constant kind of fragmentation. And if we're to talk, if we're to speak Deleuze and Guattari here, the constant deterritorialization and reterritorialization completely just keeps people and communities and movements so fragmented and kind of in flux that there is just zero possibility for kind of okay, we need to go north. You know, there's no time, or there's and yeah, even in time there's no way you can do this there's a the future's just been just blasted by capital yeah i think that's interesting especially in you saying that we should go north as in because i i'm not sure who said this i don't know if it was mark or if it was land or someone i think it might have been land but talking about capitalism in terms of the thing um as in john carpenter's the thing yeah as in is or maybe is that even negrostani I can't remember, but um, I think that's a great way of thinking about it, especially in that in the Deleuze Guattarian sense of like this. So the thing being this alien that absorbs everything that it comes into contact with, and it's this kind of horrific entity. It's a de it deterritorializes. It's a deterritorializing entity that nevertheless reterritorializes in its absorption of what is outside of itself. And that process in itself is horrific. It's kind of capitalism is if you're going to give it agency and give it a give it a shape and a face, it's the it is the thing. Yeah, but then the, but then the thing in that film, there's never the initial thing. It's kind of there's a there's a sense that it's just always been somewhere and perhaps isn't always aesthetically this way. So you talk about face, it's kind of like has it taken this face or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you have the people, like the characters in that film, that they like they have that the uh, it's kind of like a who done it, I guess, of like who's yeah. who's the thing and who's not the thing, and you, these people are kind of they 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 are they're zombies, right? They're kind of turned into these sort of kind of mindless simulations of the person that they were, and then you piss off that you piss off that simulation, and then you get the kind yeah. of you mutant get the, yeah, the... mess. Um. That you kind of see later. Re- you guess you could call it re- the reality, but then there's this, there's, there's a certain sense that when you finally do witness the grotesque thing, yes, it's horrible, but there's a there's a definite sense that there's still something underlying that which you're never going to be able to get. Yeah, the reality is there's no reality or something, or there's oh, it's uh, isn't it, it actually is this something that isn't this something that you said on <laughs> on uh, Twitter today actually, which is you said. Capital makes representation is yeah. I had that. I, 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 uh, this that was because of something yeah, I read. That no, I uh, the, I've got that written in capitalist realism under the horizons of the thinkable quote because you take this notion right. Kantian representation as as I always think of it as as like a, throwing a cloth on top of a, a cloth that kind of sticks right to the edges of the thing in itself, the real. So you can only ever see this cloth. You can only ever see the representation. But yeah. capital can do whatever the hell it wants with this representation. And throughout time and throughout material and throughout space, that just completely ruins humanity. They don't know what the hell to do because the real's, the real's gone and they have, you know, these, this representation just completely, can completely change. And that, that sounds like the thing yeah. to me, really. So oh, <laughs> it, doesn't bear, it doesn't bear thinking about it, but we will. 
<laughs> oh, it does. Yeah, that, but we do it yeah, anyway. I think. Yeah, it's it's kind of horrible because the more you discuss it, and you you realize this capitals is kind of probably laughing at this this podcast. Um, yeah, but I guess that's partly. I mean, I think that's at least something to say to 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 drag it back to Mark's work. I think that's the key of the weird and the eerie. And that book being all about that horror. And I feel like that book, especially with it being Mark's last book published before he died, and I, I, and this is partly also my critique of people kind of ad, uh, adopting um, acid communism for these kind of mindfulness things or whatever else, this kind of neo hippiedom, is that it, reject, it rejects the fact that that was to come after the weird and the eerie. And, and, and I think that the, the horror of that book is so important to what was to come in that very sense that the, the, the thing, the, even the thinking about the thing as like a, as a thing, it's this kind of psychedelic mutant acidic creature, alien thing. Uh, and the horror of that is central to, 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 to prettify acid communism into nice niceness mindfulness yoga retreat stuff to, to cut out to cut out the horror yeah, of the yeah, weird yeah, yeah. Is... Uh, what is it that said in you have to get to the heart of horror it's the only the only way you can deal with horror is to be you know at heart. yeah the heart of darkness right it's the it's the yeah, the, you curse, have, you have the take curse function the, the boat journey you, have, uh, you know that's the only way you can you, but you'd have to come back yeah. from that as well. That's yeah. I mean, the the boat journey is it's horrific at the end, but it's also meditative. You know, it's not to say that you have to reject the that side of it, but the, I think the two are you can't separate them. And I feel like that's what Mark's work was getting at that that the you have to take the rough with the smooth, and to do one or the other is kind of just to miss the point completely they are necessary necessary bedfellows yeah so you say about the rough with this move so that would kind of would that, would that imply then that the left have this idea literally kind of a grass is always greener and then they, they believe there's this way that we could just like kind of flick a switch and all of a sudden we're in this move and the rough is like gone and that's the left that that is kind of regressive and and Fisher wish to move away from um Pretend, yeah. Well, um, I guess it's. I think that the best way that that I think about this, and I wrote this in an essay on capitalist realism that I had published a couple of months ago, is that um, acid communism is, is a project beyond the, pres- the pleasure principle. And I think that ties into. I mean, Mark was hugely influenced by Freud, especially in the Weird and Eerie, and all the way through sort of that the psychoanalysis. He, as much as he was unpopular, Mark was a big fan of Zizek and Lacan and all of that stuff. Um, and I feel like that the left hasn't yet moved beyond its pleasure principle. Its, its utopian politics are important and necessary for imagining new futures. But it's, a pro- it's, not to, and it's not to say that that's not worthwhile, but it is a project that must go beyond that as well. That's kind of... Um, that, you know, it's that it's eros and thanatos. It's death and death and death drive and life drive, or whatever the other one is. Well, desire, right? It's uh, um, those two things are they are the engine of the subject for Freud and I think for Mark too. And to take one of those things out, then you've broken your engine. So you don't left, want to move anywhere. The left is almost ignoring the death drive. Or have I, um, or have I missed the point? Well. No, 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 no. I mean, I think that's that's one way of putting it. I don't know if it's ignoring it, or maybe it's. I think that it can't ignore it because it's kind of acting it out in a lot of ways. It's kind of it's like it doesn't, it's it doesn't know it's there almost. It's like it's it's expressing and sort of showing its subconscious death driveness all the time, but it's like it chooses not to see it. Um, it's. I mean, I, I kind of, I still, as much as I, I end up like critiquing the left a lot, I still kind of consider myself a leftist. And I feel like that's not, uh, I don't think the left's ignorant, or at least it's not stupid. It's ignorant in the sense that it doesn't, it's, it, I don't think it, it uh, you know, on a populist level, it doesn't, it doesn't fully appreciate the mechanisms yeah, that are now existing in, place. in a time which capitalism is, you know, that's capital left that behind 
a long time ago. Yeah. I think it's something that one of is on one of Nick Land's posts and he sort of he, he acknowledges that the left has produced the best analysis of yeah. capitalism. Um and that's kind of and he, and he kind of acknowledges that but I think what's what's kind of missing from that is to say that but the left doesn't have a very good analysis of itself. And I feel like that's where I think the right has quite a decent analysis of the left, especially in like things like the cathedral. I feel like the cathedral, as polemic as yeah. it is, highlights a lot of left of the left blind spots that it doesn't attune to. And I think if it did that and kind of was more honest with how it's uh, honest about it, not its failures and its successes and how it has shaped the world as a kind of hegemony beyond its kind of the it doesn't you know the left not acknowledging the fact that it's kind of it does it sort of sets the boundaries at the moment and not realizing yeah like, so the left always, always i mean the left just kind of always sees itself as soon as the process changes the left's always trying to find a way to separate itself and be above it in some way or create a structure wherein it can be above it um yeah i i um or I, I, even below it i feel like this is i feel like this is the this is the the left melancholy that walter benjamin talked about and wendy brown and even mark i think especially sort of in the like we were saying before about the vampire's castle and i think like that moralism that he's talking about comes from that sort of um disenfranchisement with itself okay. and kind of like attacking itself and i feel like it's that the, the left has been for all of its failures and it's and it and it holds its failures sort of very it always thinks about its failures and never its successes and i think that the the, the point of the cathedral is sort of a as a as an analysis um what that very polemically suggests is that the left's been very successful in kind of setting the tone for politics um for sort of shifting that you know, people talk about the Overton window or whatever, that it's kind of shifted backwards and the left kind of hasn't really appreciated the power that it's had in setting the agenda in a lot of ways and continuing to do that. And the right can rightly rebel against that and and sort of want to follow its own goals. But I think then the key is that the left just, the, the, the blind spot is just not realising that it's managed to do that in the first place. As if to say that that's just, that the... the, the the environment that we have now that the right is so deeply against, the left sees it as common sense, um, but doesn't see the establishment of that as common sense as a victory for itself. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 that makes sense. Um, okay. I think I think as as you've, I think that's a good kind of point to stop with regards to the leftism. But we we did briefly then move on to the weird and the eerie, which I think is um. On my first read through, it was you kind of. I kind of thought there's so many references going on, and I didn't take too much through it. And then when I went through again, there was more coming out of the woodwork. And I've, I've underlined a few quotes here. And there's one that, particularly, going back to what we were saying about this kind of horizon. Mark says, "For what is any setting in real uh, in realist fiction, if not the same kind of system? How is any reality effect achieved except by authors using the literary equivalent of simulatory techniques?" Um, and he's referencing here a Philip K. Dick story where this small town is revealed to be this kind of intricate system of pasteboard frontages, hypnotic suggestions and hallucinations. Um, and I think what one thing Mark does with this idea of the horizon is he takes it away from that kind of metaphysical Heideggerian notion, which is this grand notion of kind of anthropomorphic agency. And it really takes it away from that, that kind of kind of serious philosophical calendar, not to say that capitalism isn't serious, but, and then it puts the horizon back into reality, into the realism and says, you know, this horizon is, is kind of around the corner. Hmm. Well, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, to drag it back into the philosophical, it's, it's the, it's like the Kantian transcendental, right? It's a, it's a, it's a much easier way to kind of understand that concept. Um, but most importantly for this book is to also, you know, show a way beyond it to 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 show that the horror. I think there's a. I mean, I think there's another part in the book where Mark's talking about the. He talks about the outside and the outside as a as a kind of the Kantian idea is super yeah. central to the whole book. But he makes. But he stresses in the introduction that the uh, terrors are not all there is to the outside, and it's as if to say that that yeah, that sometimes sometimes the horror of the outside is simply revealing the nature of the status quo. 
um, as if to say that you, you it, it gives you it to to take a new vantage point. As if to say that, like the the from the the the, the Dean the Jody Dean quote from earlier, where she talks about that you know a horizon is it's impossible to reach. You can't escape or cross it, but an external observer could nonetheless <laughs> see you do so, even if you couldn't perceive that you were doing it. And I think that 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 element that's always in a lot of sci-fi. I think that Mark sees those sees those stories as being kind of a key to suggesting what we could do with a sort of shift in perspective which doesn't have to be quite so radical and absolute as a sort of philip k dick novel it can be as you know as simple as shifting perspective in terms of you know politically or whatever or just at least being more open to different viewpoints yeah um so i think perhaps we should define the weird and weird and eerie here just quickly maybe starting with i've got the one for weird so mark says the weird is constituted by a presence the presence of that which does not belong. So I don't know if you can think of any examples or if you have anything to say about this, this idea of the weird in terms of what we've kind of already spoken about, if there's anything you can think of. Um, or, or if you have anything kind of general to say about uh, the weird uh, and the eerie. The, uh, the weird's a tricky one. I feel I, I I went through this book really slowly last year, and I was I was part of a reading group. We went sort of read a chapter once a week, and we went so deeply into it. And kind of as you said, I have the same experience of I read it in sort of one sitting the first time, and kind of glossed through it, and then later found there was so much more in there. Um, but in saying that, the weird was kind of always the one that sort of felt slightly more slightly more obvious in a way, as if you kind of you know when something's weird. Um, yeah, when something should, the fact should of, be. Yeah, which I guess is kind of it links into what we're saying about the thing, like the no realizing the thing because of the the way this person, like a person's behavior, this person that's become a zombie or whatever, or um, uh, like my like so my my, my one of my favorite films is uh, the nineteen seventies version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers with like a uh, just um, Don Sutherland in, and the whole sort of horror of um the kind of the the red terror of that film of it kind of this uh underlying analogy of communism and the cold war and and the weirdness of um people the the, the character in that film can't attest to um the, the way that something is off so they're like their 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 loved one will be replaced by a plant alien or whatever and grown overnight and the next day that they'll know that that something's not right they their behavior does not fit into what this person that's known, but the horror is that, that, that no one else can relate to that. And I feel like that's kind of, that's an exemplary example of the weird for me, if it's that, yeah, that there's something that, you know, doesn't fit. And, and on a social level, that could be really horrifying. So whether or not this is, or weird, it's almost like meta weird, you know, which is blue velvet when the yellow man, I think that's that's all his name is just kind of yellow suit he gets killed and then they leave the room and come back in and this guy who's got a bullet through his head which is kind of normal in terms of watching a film you know people people can get shot but the, the he's still just stood he's just stood up completely straight and hasn't fucked to the floor and everything else about the shot is completely completely kind of normal, well as normal as david lynch could be uh but you're you're left with this idea that the weird then is okay is the director allowed to do that and i you know oh he can just he's he's given himself permission to just say like oh no your character doesn't fall over he just stands there now um it's like this meta weird kind of like you were saying about mark saying about shifting your perspective it's ways like that where you just kind of you you know you almost need someone you need to see films like that to say you know what you're allowed to do this you know you're allowed to just move your perspective um I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to watch Invasion of the Body Snatchers now. I've yet yet to watch that. Oh, it's great! Yeah, <laughs> we're talking about that film all day, <laughs> but I won't. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. Um, but I feel like there's so many. I mean, there's so many more examples. Um, but I guess the weird in that, in the sense of what we've been talking about, the weird is kind of the um, expanded out from that context. Is uh, I guess it's the, the 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 horror of automation, right? That we were talking about before, or something. These these things that don't belong to the status quo yeah um that will sort of they the, they are happening yeah yeah they're there yeah. they're kind of there with the, the people talk about things being weird all the time donald trump in the white house can you could say yeah. sort of a weird I'm, I'm finding that actually a lot because when you talk to, when you talk to people about automation 
people have this idea of those kind of 70s almost soviet style cartoons where you've got like robots with big arms just on conveyor belts but then when you say well cool. actually uh automated checkouts that you know self-serve checkouts they i think they replace on average about two to four workers i think and that's automation uh and then so when you say to people about okay well i think it's out of 30 million jobs in the uk in the next 10 years one million of them definitely will be automated people just kind of say things like oh well that'd be nice but then there's this kind of the weird there is the acknowledgement of no literally is already happening like these kind of these i mean this is almost go, going into the realm of hyperstition where these weird fictions from the kind of golden era of sci-fi you know that we've always dreamed of are now actually becoming reality and and when that when you see that reality it's like okay this shouldn't that's a fiction you know that shouldn't be a re real i'm just trying to think of any more examples i don't know if you, i don't know if you'd agree if that's weird but no totally i mean i think that I think in a way, and I think what's important to, to, to say here in this context anyway, is that like, um, I guess part of what we glossed over before in talking about Ghosts of My Life, that in part of the thing that Mark's talking about in terms of time, and so the book's a collection of a lot of K-Punk posts, and Mark always gave this sort of special position to music, and he's mourning the fact that the new has kind of disappeared from music. There's nothing that's kind of, there's nothing weird about music anymore yeah. in a, in a pop sense, pop's not weird enough for him anymore, which you can kind of argue isn't necessarily true anymore. And I think that's maybe why Mark moved beyond that. But, but I think the weird Miri kind of exemplifies that there are other forms of aesthetics, other forms, other forms of fiction, other forms of art that can nevertheless yeah. tell us something about the moment that we're living in. Um, and I think that that's exactly it in a way that how do you how do you quantify the actual effect and the implications of what we've what you've just said in terms of automation in a way that's kind of culturally resonant and I think that's a lot in a way is that's what's kind of difficult for that that's kind of what struggles to be grasped in that sense of no future or whatever that the future is still happening but we have kind of lost the way to talk about and comprehend it and kind of um yeah, articulate it's, it's, it i think i think mark does call it a haunt you know um okay the weird's really difficult to talk about because we we've come up with these these examples but what kind of happens when you think of the example is either your brain kind of in thinking about them gets a bit weirded out and you just can't kind of can't structure them in such a way where you can articulate it very well because what's weird it's it's um uncanny in in a way you know you just know something's off uh mm. like very new uh, animatronic or android kind of robot types when they start talking things you know it's a robot but it's the absolute kind of effort it's putting into to try to be human that your brain's going like no i don't want that that's not that shouldn't be um okay so then if you we move on to the yeah. eerie mark says the eerie concerns the unknown when knowledge is achieved the eerie disappears uh, yeah how do you take that um well i think the way that i always think about the eerie at least you're so you define the weird as the something that's there that shouldn't be yeah and and the eerie is uh i think the best um, definition that Mark gives in the book itself, as he says, it's the it's the failure of absence and the no, it's the the presence of uh, what is it? Yeah, failure of absence and a failure of presence. Okay. So it's kind of it's a it's a it's a it's the absence of presence and it's the presence of absence. Okay. It's that it's that strange in between this. It's the it's the spectre that we talked about with capitalist realism, right? It's the it's the it's the hologram. It's the immaterialized future that is there, but uh, but is also not there. That's kind of a uh, somewhere in between. And I guess that's kind of the the. I mean, that's part of the the to draw on your example. And this is where this book ends up getting really convoluted too. Is that um. So the example of that guy in uh, Blue Velvet. Yeah. And there you've got there you've got someone that, that, that they've 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 been shot, but then you you have this, despite their character being removed for one of yeah. their words, they're still there, 
there's 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 an absence of life and there's a presence of life nonetheless and that in between this is kind of there's the eerie weird quality i feel like lynch is a kind of really i think mark talks about lynch a few times but he's kind of the worst example to use to try and define to try and split the two because he's always somehow both at once because lynch just can do that <laughs> um but that's the way oh yeah to talk if you talk to to think about them both at least in spatial terms of something that's yeah the weird is something that's there but shouldn't be the eerie is something that is neither there nor nor not there like the future i guess is maybe mark's way of what well what mark doesn't say but i think we can implicitly think draw from the, another another good example perhaps of the eerie would be uh andre tarkovsky's yeah. stalker um hopefully you've seen that uh of the zone in general um and all they're kind of doing in this film is which makes it sound very simple it's three three men i mean there is the the whole narrative of the room at the end but that's not needed for this discussion it's up to the point is three men kind of just walking through derelict rural uh, i think it's estonia um but in the film it's kind of a strange place where nothing really happens but it's shot and discussed in such a way that everywhere they are, there is still something else there. So it's just, I think Mark actually says the presence of nothing at some point. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's, it's, the that, that whole concept is hinged on that sense of paradox, I think. Okay. Is there anything, is there anything you feel we, we should uh, discuss? Or anything, you know, you really, a specific part of Mark's work that you love? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, there's so much of it. Um, which is part of what's that's something to love and also there's so much of it to love um i think one thing that i'd want to that i should have mentioned you to you before actually is um mark's essay good for nothing um which he wrote for the occupied times in 2014 which i think is such an important text for him and it might actually be kind of an apt note to end on um i don't know if you've read that i can send you a uh, link yeah perhaps while i'm skimming this if you could give a brief yeah, well, I mean, the, I think the overview, I guess, is that I think what's, I guess it's the challenge of Mark's work now. And I think that there's something that, I mean, the reason I didn't say this to you before almost is that I wondered whether it was even worth bringing up. But now that we've kind of given this really broad overview of sort of the, the, the these threads that are there throughout all the 20 years of Mark's work, and the other thing that's always there is his own depression. Yes, yeah, one thing I was, depression. wasn't overly sure on bringing up or not. I mean... I think you can, you could discuss his work without it, but you'd be doing it a huge disservice and any ideas would somewhat, you'd feel there's something missing because there's a lot of philosophers you could, you could, you can leave the biography completely alone. I mean, if you take Kant or Descartes, you know, you could leave the biography, but you take some certain other philosophers and a, to a, a certain degree, you read something and you kind of do need to know what kind of person they were um and mark certainly i think well 100 percent falls into this this category of personal biography becomes a philosophy and is completely integrated in with his work yeah i think and i think that's kind of what that's kind of why i'd suggest this essay really in a way because this is that's basically what this is about and i think it's key in the the, the end of the very first paragraph here where he talks about where he says um I offer up my own experiences of mental distress, not because I think there's anything special or unique about them, but in support of the claim that many forms of depression are best understood and best combated through frames that are impersonal and political rather than individual and psychological. And I feel like that's that's so key for almost everything that we've kind of talked about so far is that there's the, 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 the as I think as much as Marx's work what he's what he's gearing up towards and what was potentially to come with acid communism is kind of a radical a suggestion that a, a kind of practical suggestion that we need a radical break from how we understand ourselves as as okay. humans as subjects under this kind of hegemonic order that is capitalism and i think there's a one of a um in the in the introduction to acid communism, Marx kind of talking about that explicitly, where he's drawing on Foucault and Foucault's use of acid um, in Death Valley, uh, and Foucault talks about uh, would later write about what is necessary is to sort of radically embrace or become this other, this this other kind of subject, uh, and I think that's what Marx talks about in Capitalist Realism in terms of a collective subject, and it's what 
and that sense of collective subjects as some as a as a complete reimagining of how we understand ourselves is kind of what carries all the way through and i think part of that for mark is that where this where his depression is so important for him as a thinker is that it's not only it's it's kind of the paradox of his thinking where it's how do you how do you how do you think it's the horror of his thinking which is how do you think beyond anything that is currently knowable to you and i feel like his depression in a way is kind of it's it is it is the epitome of a double-edged sword of that thinking is that mark uses his depression to diagnose the condition that we're in um really adeptly and kind of quite surgically and at the same time his depression is kind of is is likewise uh, allows him to better think that beyond it is almost to say that like his depression is kind of necessary to his thinking beyond himself as as a and it's i mean not to romanticize that or to kind of um say that people can't imagine features unless they're depressed but i feel like it's it it, it gives it, it gives him a certain recklessness with the subject that allows him to um no i don't know I guess it's personalizing it. It's like pers- personalizing it is kind of the way to talk about it, but also the wrong way to approach it completely. Like you know, it's it, it's 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 for him. It's it's he's using his own experiences in a way that's totally impersonal. Um, but you can't at the same time get away from the personal nature of that. It's kind of like the weird paradox of of what depression means socially and for the individual subject. And I think his work demands both of those things. He, did, he says on uh, page 37 of Capitalist Realism, the current ruling ontology denies any possibility of a social causation of mental illness. The chemical biolog- biologization of mental illness is, of course, strictly commensurate with its depoliticization. You know, um, considering mental illness as, as an individual chemical biological problem has enormous benefits for capitalism. So once again, this this uh you know the parasite of capital even kind of takes your your personal your person you know you have this illness that that's that's extremely personal to you and yet capital is is benefiting from it um but to move move back to you know strictly personal mental illness it's it's there's that difficult double bind there with with any any author in who's or thinker who'd struggled with a specific kind of illness or um ailment is it's almost unfalsifiable well, it is unfalsifiable to say whether their work would even exist or what it would be like have it if that hadn't been there you know it's 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 extremely tough to to quantify where, where what to say about yeah. it really well i think i mean that's the way that i think i guess that's what's important is that so, I mean, so it, in this good for nothing text, towards I mean, Mark's talking about his personal experiences, but t- towards the end, he sort of says that we, we can we we all on un- un- depression, and um, well, I'm trying not to blur this with my own interpretation, but I think even to go right back to what we were talking about in the beginning of uh, talking about this this capital as this un- having this unspeakable quality. And that coming through in Blanchot uh, and talking about communism is likewise having it's this community that's sharing the unshareable. And I think that that's kind of what, in a similar way that Mark uses depression, is that yes, it's it's something that he has quite a, a very personal experience with. Um, but it's kind of in recognizing the fact that it's not it's a, it's a, it's an it's a it's a problem that we understand individually, and we need to be better at understanding it collectively. And he says at the end that collective depression is the result of ruling class of the ruling class project of resubordination, as if to say that like you know the just the, the whole the whole modus operandi of capitalism is to just depress you, of to depress you about Monday mornings and Sunday nights and and um, to the cost of living and commuting and all of that stuff is just it wears you down and and that is all part of this project of subordination under capitalism and subordination to complete auto production yeah right so it's like the so it's it's it, it, so mark talks about it rather than depression you could also talk about it as like a consciousness deflation deflation and he kind of i think he he in this text in particular he's talking about his own background as a, a, a working class background um 
and he kind of ties the two together of saying that, you know, depression and class consciousness, depression as a deflation of consciousness and class consciousness as having been deflated, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're two intrinsic things that have been separated for far too long. And a major part of his project, I think, is to try and recombine those. And less so in a lot of his books, but in his essays in particular, um, of seeing what can happen if we collectively understand depression as kind of this thing that we are all kind of going through in some sense and not individualizing it and using that new knowledge to improve um, improve society and improve all of our lives in a way of, of kind of breaking out of that project that's kind of keeping people down um, and kind of using, you know, rather than it's kind of a revolutionary rhetoric, really. It's kind of it's a it's a, a telling the workers to rise up, but framed in a way that is totally in tune with the with the the discourse around mental health that's now so prevalent. And I think he was really tapped into that. And I think there's a, a, a you know a, a further kind of key thing to say on that is that, and this is something that Kojo Eshin said to me uh, last year after Mark had died, and. He said that, you know, just because Mark killed himself doesn't mean that his work has to stop working. It might have stopped his ideas and his kind of his uh, his optimism for the future might have stopped working for him. But it doesn't mean that it has to stop working for anybody else. And I think encapsulated in that is this very collective sense of what Mark was trying to do you know, to try and, to try and say that Mark's. To try and say that whatever for whatever reasons Mark died, to say that that has to have any bearing on his work in a in a sort of or a biographical way, um, is kind of to miss the point of the project, and it's kind of and if anything, the the tragedy of what happened to Mark kind of strikes that project in stark relief. I think it kind of renews the necessity of thinking about not just depression but capitalism as a whole in that way for him. And for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think, um, yeah, that was one of a, an ending. That's a really erudite kind of reflection on um, the connection there between between depression and, and Mark's work. And I, don't, I think, you know, I, I couldn't say much more on that. So perhaps we should end there. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Brilliant. That was fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs>